there's a lot of places to jump in. Okay, so what roughly do I mean? What is the branch of a wave function? <clears throat> so first, uh, just by using this word, I have to, of course, uh, emphasize that this is not dependent on a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics or anything like that. Um, and this is something that can be formulated as a mathematical phenomenon, uh, albeit one that is not yet precisely characterized. So as just sort of uh, to defend that, like, you know, wh wh why should you be interested in something that uh, seems so vague right now? And I'm going to claim that it's sort of uh, analogously, very loosely analogous, analogously to phase transitions or sort of the historical development of the understanding of phase transitions. So in both cases, the existence uh, was kind of first indicated by uh, intuitive macroscopic uh, observations. You know, you see uh, water uh, freezing into ice and these sort of things. So you know that something is there. There's something that dramatic that happens on large scales, uh, but you don't quite understand it. Uh, you start studying at first uh, the, the, the phenomena in kind of uh, simple uh, toy models, uh, and you can do computations, uh, you know, analytic computations, you can do numerical simulations, and this produces a lot of data uh, in some sense that you can then think about and you try to generalize that to a, a general theory. But an abstract and fully general mathematical characterization is hard. Uh, so it's definitely hard in phase transitions. It was, in, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was and continues to be an incredible, incredibly rich uh, idea in uh, condensed matter physics. And uh, my claim uh, is, is that uh, the, the idea of a branch uh, in a wave function uh, is, is sort of of this form, has this uh, same sort of thing. We're gonna start with something abstract and, and try to get to something more concrete. Um, so let's start with our vague definition, at, you know, sort of at the level of what, what do I mean by a, 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 a phase transition? Well, it's like ice freezing, okay. So, uh, the, the first thing you can think about is this, this is just what we mean by measurement outcomes when we take a unitary approach. So I'll say that again, if you have a unitary quantum model of a measurement, the wave function components corresponding to macroscopically distinct outcomes, that's roughly what I mean by branches. So that is at least an example of branches. So uh, I, I, I think most people here will be familiar with, but it's, it's, it's worth emphasizing this. Uh, that if, if you give a unitary uh, quantum model of a measuring interaction, so not just the thing that is measured, but also the thing doing the measuring, uh, if that measuring device works, it will generically create branches in the wave function. Uh, so you say, okay, I'm putting my uh, uh, electron uh, through a Stern-Gerlach experiment. Uh, it is uh, uh, deflected by the uh, inhomogeneous magnetic field. Uh, that uh, leads to some transistor somewhere lighting up and not another transistor lighting up and some current flowing and eventually gets uh, uh, amplified all the way up to the scale where my computer uh, can can tell me oh yeah the, uh, the you know there was a, there was a readout and we got we got up uh, came for that outcome uh, and so that means you know that there that the device should undergo this sort of uh, dynamical evolution and of course if we put in the opposite Thing. If we put in an uh, electron with spin down, we should get a macroscopically distinct evolution. So the first line is spin up, it you, know, you, you end up getting a uh, current in, uh, res uh, a transistor that corresponds uh, to, the, to the up outcome, and then that's blown up to your computer can tell you that it's up. Uh, alternatively, if the spin is down, uh, then this unitary evolution uh, should, uh, should uh, result in the current flowing in some other transistor and your equipment telling you, oh, it's, it's down. But then uh, obviously just from the linearity of quantum mechanics, if you put in something that's an initial superposition of these two possibilities, then that unitary evolution just is necessarily going to uh, create uh, these macroscopic superpositions. Um, so that's sort of what uh, one way you can think about branches or one example of branches. Uh, the problem with this is that one, it's anthropocentric. It's, it's, it's you know, concentrating on something that's happening in a laboratory. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> it's not clear exactly what, you know, what is a measurement? What counts as a measurement? Um, so let me try to generalize this a little bit. We're, we're, we're still gonna be vague, uh, but we're gonna try to reduce our reliance on the concept of measurement. So uh, now, instead of giving a unitary quantum model of a measurement, we're gonna consider a classically chaotic system and the branches are gonna uh, correspond to macroscopically distinct outcomes again. And the thing that I think is uh, uh, not 
enough emphasized. Most uh, people don't seem uh, to be aware, although uh, some, I'm sure some in this audience are, is that if you have a classically chaotic system, uh, so in this case, I am talking about a, uh, uh, I'm using the example of a dumbbell pendulum, something very simple. You've got a couple of masses. They're very human scale. You know, maybe the, the length of these arms are, are, are half a meter and the masses are a kilogram or two or something like this. Uh, these will uh, be associated with Lyapunov exponents. This is the, the characteristic time scale on which nearby trajectories, I guess at the, just at the classical level, uh, will uh, uh, diverge from each other in phase space. Um, if you give a quantum description to this, meaning you get you you know you consider the wave packet of these degrees of freedom, uh, maybe you gave did it at the atomic level, or you just did it at a very kind of crude level of just having two or three degrees of freedom that you gave a, a quantum description to. Uh, it is a uh, 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 just ubiquitous case. Uh, that what you get is whenever you have these Lyapunov exponents, uh, you get macroscopically distinct outcomes that are generated uh, on the associated time scale. So even if you start uh, with something that's in kind of a, a, a what we would call a quasi-classical state, you know, all the atoms are associated with wave functions that are uh, well localized in position and momentum, uh, in not too long, your, uh, your description, this unitary quantum model of this classically chaotic system uh, is going to end up having support over these uh, different uh, macroscopically distinct outcomes. Now, of course, we don't see that. Um, oh, and this is, of course, the, uh, uh, you know, just, just the, the kind of cartoon version of that, where we start with some uh, 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 kind of quasi-classical description. We're going to evolve to a superposition of different quasi-classical descriptions. Uh, and of course, this is going to be a, a continuum. So I'm just here, I'm expressing it as a sum of two discrete outcomes. Uh, but in general, because these are continuous degrees of freedom, uh, it's going to be a, a superposition over many uh, continuous configurations. Um, but when this happens, of course, as soon as these things are generated, they are decohered. And in fact, it's a continuous process of both of those things happening. They're, they're, they're being generated and, and decohering. Uh, and in this case, you can think about it as the air in the room and the light that is shining around it or vibrations um, are all going to uh, uh, become correlated uh, with the macroscopic configuration of this double pendulum. Uh, and so the quantum description is going to look something like this. Again, at the cartoon level, we're going to start out with some configuration of the double pendulum. You know, the air molecules will be somehow, and the light in the room will be somehow. You'll evolve your system, and you will end up uh, uh, in a superposition uh, where the air and the light are in states, orthogonal states, conditional on the macroscopic state of the system. Uh, and so th this is the thing that I mean by uh, branches. So this is what I'm, I'm gesturing towards, and we would like to get a more precise definition of. Um, now, this uh, has an advantage over that measurement uh, definition is that it's less anthropocentric. It is not specific to, to, to lab equipment or anything like this. It's something you just see in all sorts of real life systems. Uh, uh, however, uh, there are still serious problems, um, which uh, in particular, uh, the question arises is what are the preferred degrees of freedom that are, that are decoherent? Um, and how would we define this uh, from first principles. So you might have thought that that uh, previous uh, uh, story was, was enough. And so I'm going to try to convince you here. Uh, the decoherence is not sufficient uh, for understanding this in generality. Um, so the decoherence program is grounded in a preferred system environment tensor decomposition. Uh, and you know what people have seen over many years is that you have these toy models given a plausible initial state and interaction for the system. Uh, and initially pure isolated systems will irreversibly decohere uh, in a preferred basis that intuitively corresponds to these branches. So that exists and is uh, deep and insightful. Uh, and so that, as I said, allows us to generalize away from the lab. Uh, you don't have to talk about measuring devices. But it still requires this preferred degrees of freedom, the split in the system and environment. So you can think about it as decoherence solves the preferred basis problem, uh, but it creates the preferred uh, subsystem problem, the 
uh, subsystems of the universe. You know, what is a double pendulum and, and how is that different from, from air? These are not encoded in the laws of the universe, right? The double pendulum is made of atoms. The air is made of atoms. Uh, the, the, the pendulum uh, atoms are bound together, but of course they weren't bound together in the distant past. Maybe the atoms were scattered all over, they coalesced, they did some things and then they spread apart again. Uh, so without a, uh, a fundamental definition of what a system is, it is hard to give a fundamental definition of what branches are. So we, wanted, we, we are left, even with this decoherent story, we were left with the question of what are the subsystems that decohere? Um, so we don't know that they don't have a, a good uh, uh, kind of comprehensive theory of that, uh, but there are uh, uh, this you know problem has been studied over the years, and there is sort of some reoccurring uh, 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 examples of these preferred subsystems or preferred degrees of freedom. Um, so you know the one I just gave an example of is the center of mass coordinate for a macroscopic number of bound particles. Um, so they are in some uh, configuration where they're chemically bound to each other. Uh, each of the atoms, of course, has its own uh, coordinate, its, its own position and momentum. Uh, but that's not the thing that decoheres. And in fact, those atoms will be doing all sorts of crazy things and be in quantum states, and they won't be acting classically at all. However, the center of mass coordinate, a kind of summary variable, will behave classically, um, or at least classically under certain assumptions. Uh, so the famous example of Yos and Zay. Uh, but there are a few other uh, key um, examples uh, of, of, of preferred subsystems like this. Um, so a, another uh, large class of preferred system, subsystems are hydrodynamic variables. So in a fluid, these are the local spatial averages of conserved quantities like uh, energy, angular momentum, charge, and particle number. Uh, the hydrodynamic variables are notable just in general uh, because in a fluid where you're getting uh, many rapid interactions and mixing, uh, the, uh, the conserved quantities uh, can only sort of uh, change slowly because they actually have to be uh, carried uh, from uh, one spatial point to another. Uh, but within a region, you have some conserved quantities that are, that are, that are quasi fixed. Uh, but, up, but for everything else that's not conserved, you get very, very high uh, quick mixing and you approach a thermal state. So it's these uh, things uh, like you know, the, you know, the, the velocity of a fluid um, or its angular momentum and vortices and these sort of things that appear to decohere and act uh, quasi-classically. Uh, and uh, uh, more or a, a third example are uh, source configurations for long range fields. Um, so we don't seem to find a lot of uh, superpositions of, of, of macroscopic electromagnetic fields. They're very delicate, they decohere. Uh, likewise, the gravitational field, we don't, uh, or we, we would love to see superpositions of the gravitational field, but again, uh, these decohere very quickly. Those seem to be preferred degrees of freedom. Um, now it has been noticed and certainly commented on many times over the years that the thing that these sort of have in common is they are related to locality. So the locality of interactions that Hamiltonians kind of couple things that are nearby uh, and a many to one nature uh, that uh, when you have a preferred degree of freedom, its environment kind of has many parts that all talk to that preferred degree of freedom, uh, but don't as much uh, talk to each other. Um, so although this has been not, uh, noticed, uh, there's sort of no unified uh, theory of this. And so that's what we want to move towards. Um, one way to sort of hammer down even more on the problem uh, is to ask, you know, are there alternative ways to decompose the world that are equally good? How much have the um, uh, things that we've seen so far, uh, or do those depend on just, you know, what humans happen to be interested in, or is there something special uh, ab about them as far as the universe is concerned from a non-anthropocentric uh, kind of point of view? Um, so are these intuitive degrees of freedom we prefer unique, or is there some sort of other way to break the world up, you know, S tilde, the, the, some alternative system that would be just as good? Um, so again, these kind of questions have been asked, uh, but there's really no comprehensive answer yet uh, that has been found within the decoherence program. So, Quantum Darwinism, uh, which I, uh, I, I know at least uh, some of you are familiar with, 
uh, is better, uh, or it tells us something new, uh, but it is still insufficient. So uh, this approach is grounded in a preferred decomposition, not just into system and environment, but also into parts of the environment. Um, so breaking the environment up into chunks. Um, now, how you're supposed to do that is, is there doesn't seem to be good theory of, uh, but if you allow yourself that, if you say, well, I'm just going to assume this tensor structure in the same way I assume a system environment distinction in the first place, uh, this reveals additional special properties of the preferred systems, uh, which is this idea of redundancy, which I'm going to define precisely um, in the second half of the talk. Um, so uh, although these uh, uh, special properties are identified in, in the work on quantum Darwinism, it is still unclear whether the decomposition associated uh, with the uh, decoherence and proliferation of redundant records uh, in quantum Darwinism, whether that's unique or whether you could choose some sort of different tensor structure, uh, get a, uh, a equivalent or a, an, a, a, a description that's on the same footing, but it's incompatible with the kind of more natural description that comes intuitively. Um, so again, you are left with this question, what is the system? Uh, what are the parts of the environment? Okay, so um, should you care about this at all? Is this, uh, 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 just something uh, that is it is uh, sort of interesting, or is this something that uh, uh, should be uh, truly compelling? I think it should be truly compelling. Um, so I want you to think just for a second. Suppose you had a guarantee uh, that non-trivial mathematical structure robustly describing branches is waiting to be found, that if you have a many-body system, uh, uh, there is some preferred notion of branches that are out there, that branches are proliferating as time goes on, they remain orthogonal, um, and they, uh, on large scales, describe macroscopic outcomes. I don't know how else to say this. How could you not want to understand that? Uh, knowing uh, the connection uh, uh, to, the, to the foundations of quantum mechanics, in, to, to me, would be purely enough. I'm going to give you some other more practical applications. Uh, but just, I think that if you knew it was out there, uh, you would uh, absolutely uh, uh, want to understand it. And at the very least, uh, it would give you an answer to the question, what's a measurement? And you'd be able to say, it's when a mechanical device creates branches and branches are defined thus, some, some, something precisely. Um, so given this foundational importance, I think you should be excited and interested in this if I can show that there's something there to be found, that branches are not necessarily vague as they have been uh, uh, up to this point. Um, so that's the thing that I'm gonna concentrate on. Um, the motivating question here, or one thing that might kind of uh, get, get, you to, get you to see this more, um, is if we were simulating the universe on a computer, how would you identify the preferred subsystems or the preferred branches? So again, just, just think about the, the world is a bunch of atoms. Maybe it's a, it's, it's a quantum field theory. Uh, you're running a simulation on a giant computer and it produces this big wave function that becomes more and more entangled as time goes on. But presumably there's some sort of uh, story to tell about the classical description. Uh, how would you uh, uh, figure that out uh, from what was going on? Would you be able to look inside a, a simulation in the universe, see the dinosaurs running around in some branches and alternative uh, species running around in all the other branches? Um, how would you do that? So uh, that is the sort of question uh, this, this numerical simulation uh, question uh, is the one that's going to uh, uh, um, motivate uh, the approach I'm gonna argue for here. So, okay, here's the proposal. Uh, first is that systems must emerge. Um, so the idea is to look at, ask, what can we discover by starting only with the macroscopic structure associated with locality. So instead of taking the Hilbert space and breaking it up into a preferred system and a preferred environment or a preferred system and an environment with parts, let's just, let's just use the notion of locality. So we're gonna break the world up into uh, the individual atoms uh, that interact with each other. Or if you really wanted to go very fundamental, you would think about the little local modes of the quantum field. Um, but I'm going to kind of put this in a condensed matter context or many body context. Uh, and so I'm going to be thinking about these different modes as just say qubits um, on a lattice. Okay, so if we want systems to emerge, how should we identify them? 
Uh, and we're basically just going to go back to this intuition uh, that I tried to build up in the uh, first uh, half of this talk uh, and think about we're going to be generating these states we think that are out there. Uh, where we got we had previously broken up, we said, oh, this is the system, this is the environment. But instead, we're going to ignore which of those subsystems that we think are special. Uh, and instead, we're just going to look at this uh, special uh, uh, correlational structure that remains even after we've ignored uh, the systems that are important. And we're just looking at this notion of locality and that is gonna be GHZ-like entanglement. So now I'm gonna try to uh, uh, make that uh, more precise. Now, uh, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, this approach is an idea uh, for trying to define branch branches. It's the one I personally find most promising right now. Um, this could be totally misguided. I could be completely wrong, uh, but uh, the I'm going to hopefully argue uh, that uh, the problem of defining branches uh, remains intense, uh, intensely important. So even if you think uh, this is totally wrong, you should still care about branches. And I'm just going to try to convince you that there's a structure out there waiting for um, waiting to be found. Um, Okay, so now uh, I'm going to uh, introduce this idea of records and then redundancy. Um, these are ideas that originally came uh, kind of out of, out of uh, quantum Darwinism. And we're basically gonna try to abstract them uh, and give them a notion when, uh, or a way to define them when we don't have access to a preferred system and we are only thinking about uh, a, a lattice. Um, so, Imagine a lattice, so this is just any kind of uh, uh, you know, spatially dispersed set of uh, quantum subsystems, little Q dits, um, some low dimensional quantum systems uh, that have a microscopic uh, tensor product structure uh, that defines the lattice. Um, and uh, we are going to then uh, imagine breaking the lattice up into parts. So there's, there's when I, I'm going to be talking about a region, uh, there isn't going to be some fixed partitioning into regions. We're not going to assume anything like that, but we're just going to say, listen, uh, whenever I talk, I want to be defined some things with respect to a region. Um, so a region is just going to be a subset of lattice. It's going to be some choice of, of the subsystems. Uh, it may be contiguous. It may be discontinuous. So you might have, it might be broken up into different parts, but that's what I mean by a region. Okay, and now I want you to consider the eigen decomposition of a local observable in terms of local projectors, right? So this observable is going to act on just a region. Uh, and of course, uh, it's gonna basically act as the identity everywhere else. And if it's an observable, it has some decomposition in terms of uh, an orthogonal set of projectors plus eigenvalues. So we're actually gonna kind of ignore the eigenvalues. Uh, we're gonna kind of work with equivalence classes of observables that have the same eigenvalues. And the structure we're really gonna concentrate on and care about uh, is this, uh, uh, these, these com uh, complete sets of orthogonal projectors on local regions. Um, so just to remind you, right, a, uh, the thing that makes an orthogonal projector is it's equal uh, to its uh, Hermitian adjoint. Um, it's going to act as a projector locally. It's gonna, uh, act like the identity on, on the complement of the region everywhere else on the lattice. Uh, and uh, the set of projectors associated with a particular observable, uh, when you sum it up, you're gonna get the identity everywhere. And uh, of course, when you have uh, two different uh, uh, projectors uh, multiplied together, they are going to vanish. Um, so these are the, the, the key relations. Okay, now given a pure state, and two disjoint regions, uh, we're going to say that a local observable records another. So a, a local, a, an observable local to one region records an observable local to another region when their eigenvalues are fully correlated. Okay, so in the bottom left-hand corner here, we're gonna just imagine that we, we suppose somebody had brought our attention uh, to these, these, these two observables. Um, and we're gonna say for a given quantum state, right? So the observables are of course defined without respect uh, to any uh, particular quantum state. We're gonna say, suppose the system's in some quantum state and we also find observables that have this property where projecting on one eigenvalue for one of the observables in one region 
is gives you exactly the component of the wave function that you get for projecting on a, uh, a corresponding eigenvalue for a different observable in a different disjoint region. When that condition holds, we're going to say that the local observable, that one local observable records the other. Okay. Uh, so in, in, in this case, you can think about sort of a, a, a bell pair or a GHZ state, uh, where if you make a measurement on one qubit, you can infer uh, the, the, the uh, state of the other qubit or that, the, that component of the wave function. Um, will be uh, those will will will, will uh, be completely correlated uh, between the two observables. Um, so here's an uh, an equivalent way to describe it is that if you looked at the reduced state at one region, conditional on uh, the uh, other region's observable taking a certain value, uh, these different uh, possible values are orthogonal. So again, we're going to consider here uh, uh, projecting on a particular eigenvalue i for the observable in region one, and then looking at the reduced state of the observable in region two. So you can think about, again, like a GHZ state, I project on either zero or one for one qubit, and then consider the state of the other qubit for zero and one. And the uh, key property that this has for this uh, perfect uh, correlation like you get in a GHZ state is that the conditional states in the other region are distinguishable, they're orthogonal. Um, so the idea here is that observers can infer the value of one observable by making a local measurement on another that is recording it. Okay, so that's what I mean by one observable recording another. Uh, a important thing to observe here is that uh, this recording relationship is symmetric and transitive on local observables. So we can consider the set of all local observables. Um, you know, for any given quantum state, most local observables will not be recorded by, by another local observable. Um, but if we just uh, think about the ones that are, this is a symmetric and transitive relation, and therefore it establishes an equivalence class, right? So if, if we have a GHZ state, of 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 uh, three qubits or n qubits, you know, if the first qubit uh, uh, records the second qubit in the sense that right their their states are fully correlated, if one is in zero, the other is in zero. If that's true, then that means the second qubit records the first qubit. Of course, that's the symmetric part. And if the first qubit records the second qubit, the second qubit records the third qubit. That means the first qubit records the third qubit. So that's the transitive part. So uh, having a symmetric and transitive relation like that. Uh, establishes equivalence classes. Um, given this, we're going to kind of uh, uh, tentatively um, say that a branch is going to be associated uh, with uh, uh, these different uh, uh, redundantly recorded observables. So if we have not just that, you know, one region records another, but R1 records R2, records R3, records R4. Um, the, these different corresponding states uh, or, the, or the components of the global wave function is the kind of thing we're gonna mean by branches. So again, candidate branches are gonna be simultaneous eigenstates of a set of at, le at least two recorded observables. Um, so, this, it turns out, is not quite enough. This, this definition I've given is not quite enough to, to uh, establish uniqueness. So I'm going to introduce here a scale-dependent definition. This is a, a, a uh, kind of a, a, a crutch um, that I think a complete definition of branches would not uh, contain. Uh, but I think we'll show exactly how close we are uh, to getting a definition of branches uh, using this formalism. Uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce the scale L. I'm not going to justify it in, you know, in the same way that, um, uh, you know, the uh, giving a, a decoherence theory kind of account of, de of, of decoherence doesn't justify where the preferred system comes from. However, there's many, many, many different kinds of systems, whereas a preferred scale is a 
is a pretty small thing to assume. So in that sense, you can think about it as an improvement. So pick a scale L. Then we're going to define a, a redundant set of observables at scale L to be a set of three or more local observables that fit in disjoint spheres of diameter L, right? So, you know, here I've drawn uh, uh, four regions, R1, R2, R3, R4. They all kind of fit in, 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 in uh, to these disjoint spheres of size L. Um, and we're going to assume that they uh, record each other. That's what, that's what we mean by a redundant set of, of, of observables, uh, i.e. they are all classically correlated. So they, they are in sort of a GHZ state in a sense. Now, importantly, they, they aren't like pure. So they could be, you know, these different regions uh, could be very entangled with other parts of the lattice. So it's in no sense that they are uh, uh, exact GHZ states, but they have GHZ-like correlations in the specific sense of the equation at the bottom of this slide. Okay, so that's what I mean by a redundant set of observables at scale L. But now I want you to think about multiple sets of redundant observables. In fact, we're going to think about all possible sets of redundant observables. So you just, I hand you a state and you write down, you just exhaustively find all the possible sets of redundant observables that exist out there. So you know, maybe the bottom right corresponds to the outcome of some Stern-Gerlach experiment that has many records scattered all over the place. Uh, many, maybe uh, that's a, or the, the red redundant observable, the, the different regions correspond to the different records of that, uh, of that uh, uh, experiment or that, 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 that outcome. Uh, maybe the, the uh, O2, the, the blue, uh, records here are records of, of something else, like the, the configuration of your double pendulum, and we imagine adding more and more. So here's the main result. Uh, if you consider all possible sets of redundant observables at the same scale, they necessarily commute when acting on the state. Okay, uh, So that if I have uh, an observable that corresponds to the outcome of a stern gerlach experiment. So, you know, there's, uh, and I have, uh, you know, it's going to be recorded at multiple places. Pick any one of those places. Now consider a different uh, uh, observable that corresponds to the outcome of, uh, of, the, of the double pendulum. Oh, you know, the, the thing ended up swinging this way. Uh, it's going to be recorded in a bunch of different places in the air molecules in the room, this sort of thing. And the idea is that uh, when these uh, two uh, 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 observables, local observables, wherever these are, are applied to the state, they commute on the state. Therefore, you can define branches at some scale L to be the simultaneous eigenstates of all these redundantly recorded observables. The commutation property here is crucial for that to be well defined. Um, so if you, uh, uh, in particular, relaxed your requirement that there be not just three, uh, but two, uh, only two uh, uh, redundant records, you would not get this property of everything commuting. You would have uh, things like bell pairs where you could be uh, recorded uh, either in the up down uh, basis or you can be recorded in the left right basis. Uh, but once you move to three, and once you pick a scale L, so that things have to be separated by each other by, by, by some characteristic length scale, then that's all you need um, uh, uh, to define a uh, uh, preferred set of branches for the system. So let me just try to state this one more time uh, using uh, just slightly different words. You give me a lattice with a microscopic structure associated with it and you give me some many body wave function. And you say, Jess, what are the branches of the wave function? Or you're gonna give me one more thing. You're gonna give me a scale. So this is the thing that I, I think a, a, a complete definition of branches would not include, but it is my crutch that I'm using here. You give me a scale, you say, you know, I wanna know all the things that are recorded uh, in, in you know, a, 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 a 20 centimeter uh, uh, size records, no, no bigger than 20 centimeters. Yeah, you know, roughly the size of the human head. Um, uh, 
uh, five minutes, got it. Uh, then if you hand me that, the lattice, the wave function, and some preferred scale, I can tell you, here are all the things that are redundantly recorded. They are all compatible with each other in the sense that there is some decomposition of the wave function, a unique decomposition of the wave function that is where each of those branches, each of those components of the decomposition are a simultaneous eigenstate of everything that is redundantly recorded. And this seems very notable because there everything, you know, there, if you if you think about it, everything that we would ever ascribe something to say that this is a classical property, the position of big macroscopic objects, um, these inevitably have uh, imprints lived in the environment. Uh, there, you wouldn't even be able to talk about them and know what they were if there weren't multiple people who could all look at them and agree um, that uh, on the on the configuration of, of, of say a macroscopic. Uh, 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 macroscopic degree of freedom. Um, so it's the fact that they agree in, implies that there are these, these redundant records exist. Uh, and at least at a preferred length scale L, they are all uh, compatible with each other. Okay, um, so uh, very briefly, I'm gonna have to, uh, uh, this the couple of slides, this is the, um, uh, sort of practical ap uh, application uh, that I will just have to, uh, again, go over quickly. And I really love talking about it actually. So uh, I encourage you to ask uh, questions. Um, the claim is that this, uh, that this kind of branch structure will be useful for simulating uh, non-equilibrium systems, classically chaotic systems, um, more uh, efficient numerically. Um, so if you have a state, it has a small amount of long range entanglement as we kind of imagine the universe starts out with in some sort of low entropy state, it will have an efficient tensor network description. So matrix product states, these sort of things, if anybody's familiar with those. However, as the system evolves over time, uh, it will tend to generate uh, uh, long range entanglement. So if you just have a kind of a normal non integrable Hamiltonian system, something where the atoms are interacting with each other, they're walking around, you build up this long range entanglement and your uh, simulation becomes infeasibly slow. Um, so the strategy here is you find the branches. Uh, and importantly, this is something that you have to tell the computer to do, to, to do this numerical simulation efficiently. You need to be able to say, here's what a branch is. So the strategy is you decompose into branches and each of those branches has less long range entanglement uh, individually than the state as a whole does. Uh, and so although there is, uh, there will be an exponential number of branches. The key thing is that uh, because of the presence of records, one can show that you can estimate correlators, so expectation values of local observables by just sampling from the branches. So you don't have to keep this exponentially proliferating number of branches. You just pick them randomly kind of according to the, uh, the, the, the Born rule. Uh, and I'm just gonna uh, breeze through this, uh, but the, this, is, this is just the, uh, uh, very simple, uh, straightforward uh, 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 demonstration that a correlator for the entire state can be estimated uh, by looking at just the, uh, uh, the correlator evaluated on a small number of the branches. So you don't have to simulate them all. You identify them as they are generated by the dy dynamics. Uh, and then you just uh, 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 prune or you, you, you just sample um, from, uh, from a small subset of them. Okay. So uh, last couple slides, um, you should care about uh, branches uh, because of the foundational implications. They reduce quantum mechanics to a classically stochastic theory in a sense, right? If you just turn the crank, you have some full simulation of a, a, a big macroscopic system. If you can find the branches that each represent a distinct macroscopic outcome, uh, the probability is given by some norm squared. And then lab measurements are just some subset of a natural uh, mathematically described phenomena. Um, the practical implications, as I only unfortunately was able to, to briefly talk about, uh, basically tell you when collapse has effectively happened with some respect to some measurement capability, some set of local observables that you want to be able to compute the correlators of. Um, so uh, numerical simulations can classically sample over those branches, leaving the others to be pruned, pruned branches. Uh, and this can reduce the exponential explosion, explosion in computational resources necessary to simulate uh, many body systems. Uh, 
And uh, for those of you who are familiar uh, with, with matrix product states, the branches correspond to blocks uh, in a matrix product state representation. Uh, but then as promised, there is new questions you can ask. Uh, so first, once you have a, a, a branches defined, you can ask, what is the rate at which branches form? Is it given by the Lyapunov exponent or the, the Kamalgarov Sinai entropy of the corresponding classical system? Is the set of branches uh, unique? Uh, the definition I uh, gave uh, says that it is at least at some scale, but if you had different scales, uh, in principle, you could you can have uh, incompatible uh, sets of branches. Uh, if you can come up with a better definition that is more unique, uh, this would be you know much more compelling than what I've given so far. Uh, you can ask uh, other questions. Uh, you know what happens um, in quantum gravity systems where you know, maybe you start with a notion of locality and a, a sensible notion of branches, uh, but then locality starts to break down when you get quantum fluctuations in space-time. Uh, and finally, this is kind of my actual favorite uh, question that is enabled by definition of branches, is you ask, how long can this go on for? Um, the Hilbert space of the universe is effectively finite. Uh, branches are orthogonal. The number of branches, therefore, can't increase forever. There's only so many orthogonal uh, vectors you can put in the Hilbert space. So apparently, branching stops working so well, we stop getting classical evolution or we stop getting uh, quasi-classical states that decohere. So what happens then? And is this connected as are we currently hypothesize to thermalization? Okay, uh, I know I went over a little bit over time. Uh, that is uh, the talk. Uh, emails at the bottom, I'm, uh, if you think of questions later, but I'll uh, be happy to answer uh, the ones that are uh, read or on uh, Discord in the discussion later. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you. Uh, only only a minute over time, so don't don't, don't beat you for that. That that was great, and and I think the the talk was incredibly thought provoking. So, um, um, thank you very much for this engaging talk. So before uh, we leave the stage to the first um, contributed talk of the of the afternoon session, there were um, a couple of points raised on this code. So um, I'm going to read the question by um, Jakub. Um, uh, Zatowski. So, very vague question. Since you're introducing a kind of scale dependence, could some kind of renormalization play a role at some point of development? Uh, so, this was the, the, the question by um, Jakub. So, um, please, just. Yeah, so absolutely. So, there is, I, I don't know how uh, to think about it. You could uh, imagine that branch structure is something that, you know, just, just like you get new theories or kind of new effective field theories at different scales, you could imagine uh, different branch structures at different scales. But this would basically be very confusing. Uh, the kind of only way we know, I think, to, how to understand quantum mechanics is, is where, you know, whether or not you think about the kind of collapse postulate as fundamental, or you just think about it as some sort of effective thing on, as a kind of decoherence, it always relies on, well, I collapse the wave function, I concentrate on one component that I think represents the outcome of my measurement, and then I never have to worry about the other components ever again. Uh, but if there's different branch structures, if it depends on kind of how you're probing the system, then it becomes much more difficult to understand what's going on. Um, you know, when we're really speculating, uh, we, we, are, we will say wild things like, you know, oh, you know what's, what's, what's really going on when people are confused about black hole information paradox and these certain things is that uh, they are assuming there's some sort of specific branch structure, but in fact, there's kind of competing branch structures from, 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 from different perspectives. And, and this, is, this is leading to a confusion, um, but we really have this, I don't know. The question is, I don't know, but uh, I, I, I don't know if this length scale dependence can be eliminated or not. I think it would be compelling if it could, but it could also tell you something deep if it's kind of intrinsic. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Uh, related to uh, related to this point, there was um, there was a comment by uh, by Yarek. Uh, the scale is so on is not unnatural as it seems. It's perfectly imaginable that branches appear only on some macroscopic scale, uh, while break down more microscopic cubo. We see these in in a parallel approach to spectrum broadcast um, structures. I don't know if you want to to add on that. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I would say that, uh, so you, you it, it depends on which, if, if you say the branches are the thing that correspond to macroscopically uh, uh, distinct outcomes, uh, you would kind of want it to be the case that at least if you go to a large enough scale, the structure stops changing. You know, maybe it coarse grains, uh, but you would want it to sort of asymptote to, to, to something fixed. 
Whereas if kind of every time you went to a different scale, the structure was flipping over, I think this would be like a very unintuitive uh, uh, outcome. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to talking more about that uh, on Discord uh, or, or other channels. In fact, uh, let's say um, uh, this is an uh, incredibly thought-provoking uh, topic. I, have, I also have some questions. I will type them in, in, in Discord because I think it's only fair to thank Jet for, for his time and his beautiful presentation and move to the next to the next talk um, of, of this afternoon session. So thank you, Jess, thank, thank you very much. Indeed. Thanks very much, guys, I appreciate um, the attention.